Good afternoon. This is um, a webinar on sustainable city of the future, especially a theme on futures literacy. And the purpose of this webinar is to share different perspective on the future of uh, social accessibility in the future. And it is actually very much related to uh, the role of social enterprise. We have today a webinar uh, speakers here, all are being represented from the industry as well as uh, government institutions and agencies. And the purpose of uh, our participation here today is to showcase what we have done in our uh, get together sessions on the issues related to sustainability city Penang in 2030. As we all know, there are a lot of plans moving ahead by different uh, stakeholders in Penang, be it industry, agencies, as well as uh, higher education involved and also different industries, especially in the development uh, and service industries with regards to helping Penang to be a smart city in 2030. Yet we all know there are a lot of issues and concerns from different stakeholders, whether it's a younger generation or even the aging society or even uh, civic leaders uh, as well as residents of community with regards to what the future actually means for us and what we would like to see the future about. And in this context, the role of businesses is very important, especially the role of small industries. And in this case, we're talking about the role of social enterprise. How could social enterprise play a role to help uh, make a difference in the future? The role of social enterprise, while well, it complements the business philosophy of conventional business, uh, make a difference in ensuring that every one of us have a well-being society in the future, especially where 2030, which is 10 years from now, is concerned. So with, without ado, I will now uh, present a team of experts from the industries who have come together uh, to share uh, their thoughts and concerns about the uh, future of sustainability city in 2030. We have two groups presenting. The first group will share light about the emerging issues ultimately with regards to stakeholder engagement. And the second group will discuss about the social advocacy context of social enterprise. So if this first group ready, I will now pass over uh, the mic over to the first group. Hi and good evening everyone. We are uh, the MBA student of USM Penang and our team today will present on our research on Penang Sustainable Cities 2020 emerging issues on stakeholder engagement. Let me start with introducing myself. My name is Cynthia Madeline, and I am working at Jebel Circuit, a manufacturing industry as a buyer. My personal social advocacy is fighting against hunger. So in some few months ago, I saw two siblings who was begging for foods in a restaurant. From that day, I feel we are all entitled to have access to basic needs of life, especially having enough food to eat. In a world of abundant wealth and resources, we are enough food to produce to feed everyone on the planet. It is unacceptable that hundreds of millions of people suffer from hunger. Thus, I would like to fight against hunger. Moving on to our slide, I will begin my presentation with first deeper analysis push factor, which is social. For the first point, population growth rate in Penang has been tremendously year by year. With a diverse population and a hybrid culture, Penang is a global recognized as one of the most livable cities. Thus, we can say that there will be a rapid growth of population by the year of 2020. So this is the push factor of why to make a sustainable city planning to be happens. Next one, lifestyle change is now, people are more inclined to modern and convenience lifestyle. Each one of us like to live in a simple city and convenience and, and technologies has actually served us with the simplicity and convenience. Thus, this will make the citizen of Penang push to achieve these sustainable city's visions. Next one is social mobility, which has caused horizontal, vertical, and intergenerational mobile change. 
where the future generation need to adopt a new way of living, which is to work living in a sustainable city. Next, the demographic change. Change in population, for example, in terms of average age, dependency ratio, life expectancy, family structures, birth rate in the country. This will be changed in the next 10 years. Next one, global influence. Usually takes many forms and can be seen in conformity, socialization, peer pressure, and other which one covering, influencing, or relating to the whole world. Uh, next one, the rapid development of residential and industrial areas. As there is an increase of population, there will be a diversification of housing options. This will allow low and middle income citizens to have access to affordable home. Next one, awareness to lead healthy and active lifestyle. Implementation of more youth life coach programs. This will encourage a positive personal and also professional development setting of the youth of Penang. Second factor is technologies. As we know now, new invention and development in the market. As we know that manufacturing sector continue to play a fundamental role in Penang. As myself is also working at in this industry, I can see that there is a diverse of expertise and even already we already have advanced technology to complement this sustainable city Penang. This will embrace the rise of the industry 4.0 where the autonomous robotic and also automation is involved. Uh, next one, change in information and mobile technology. For example, uh, as we are all aware now, and I believe everyone of you also involved in this technology where we use the Penang parking apps and also touch and go Penang at more, which, which is already make a convenience to hold citizen of Penang. Uh, next one, Penang Digital Transformation Master Plan in Invasion uh, Digitality Enable and Enabling Penang. For the third push factor is economic. Lower corporate tax to attract more corporation to open an office factory in Penang. And also GDP growth will be increased as there is more factors to be open and as well as in tourism industry. We know that Penang is a leading tourism destination. It is it has its rich culture and also heritage asset. Thus, to better manage our tourism, a greater service and facilities is needed across the island and also the mainland to attract high value tourists. Next one, more job opportunity offered. The digital edge industry 4.0 and also agriculture 4.0 create more job opportunity for the communities and also attract more business to the cities. Next one, as been said, a better state's infrastructure and amenities can attract more domestic and international tourists to the Penang Island and also the mainland. Last but not least, attractive work package offer to expat and also people outside Penang to work and also people to migrate to Penang. That is all from me. I will next pass this next analysis to my team member, Lishan. Hi everyone. Thank you, Cynthia. This is Lishan here. So today, I would like to start off introduction of myself. Currently, I'm working as a planner in uh, American MNC, which is microchip, which is almost similar as uh, Cynthia's background. During my college days, I've been involved and engaged in it for helping the homeless and also um, people which are living in very bad conditions and are facing uh, poverty issues. So. For thus, I would think that to me, my personal social advocacy is to increase awareness and also to help to prevent and end homelessness issues and poverty issues in the community in our in our society. So, followed by, I will continue with the analysis of push factor, which covering of environmental, political, and so first we start off with environmental factors for push factors. So we have, our team have concluded that the environmental regulations and protection is and also the growing level of current environmental awareness among Penang Knights are quite good. So this will be the two areas that has lead us towards the Nang 2030 project. Other than that, we have also found that there is actively participation from the NGOs and social enterprises in Penang and also in 
around uh, our community. For example, there are few projects and also collaboration from some companies and so one of it will be the Penang Municipal effort in imposing new alternative ways, which is the we call it the archaeological park, which is located in the Siabwe at Georgetown. So this will be one of the very good example towards this uh, project, 203 project. Other than that, we also included at sustainability in such as the tax credits, credits, subsidies that uh, has been implemented has also led the emergence of more green innovations in the Penang city, not only among the businesses and also for the entrepreneurs and also social entrepreneurs nowadays. Next, will be I'll be covering on the political factors. Also, our current government organization and attitude is very good and it's very stable. So with this, we have able to have policy coordination, boosting intergovernmental cooperation and also build mechanism for facilitation for this project 203. So not only that, there's also good sum belt and road initiative related investment with low levels of political barriers for regional projects in Penang. So from this, we will see that the Penang state political uh, and also the organization and attitude is quite good and stable. Not only that, we will have a very good political strategies to reduce the current energy consumption in Penang state as well. As well as we are also good in increasing the energy production in Penang. So lastly, will be aesthetic factors. So here we have concluded and found that the current few sustainable urbanization and development and also another quote that has been quote which is the vision of Penang 2030 will be family focused, green and smart state inspired by the nation. Other than that, our current Chief Minister of Penang have also always encouraged on green practices and also healthy lifestyle. With that, they uh, we have also have the Chief Minister of Penang have also implemented and introduced a few projects which will help on the current uh, society, Penang Nights for the Penang Nights. So one of it will be the Penang Bicycle Road Master Plan which covering from the Georgetown to Bayang the Pass area in Penang Island. And another one will be the Penang Green Connectors project, which link different components of urban green spaces to create a network that will benefit the biodiversity. We have also another very interesting and good project which has been implemented and introduced by Chief Me of Penang, which is one of the Penang 2030 vision of revitalizing Georgetown and Butterworth waterfront. And that's all from on push factors. So next, I will pass it to Renuka and Benita to cover on the pull factors for STIPA analysis. Okay, thank you, Lishan. Good evening, everyone. I'm Punita Jayapalan. Okay, I'm currently working as an area manager for a property management company it's called Waste Segregation because it has been a uh, main uh, topic uh, from our Penang development. Then um, for my social uh, advocacy, I'm involved in many voluntary activities for the past 15 years. And also I'm a, a committee of uh, Penang Women Family Development. We focus uh, in all the social aspects, mainly covering women and family. Coming to the STIPA analysis, I'll be covering the pool factors, which is from uh, social technology and uh, economic. Okay, under cultural uh, aspects, culture uh, enables uh, environment sustainability at all various levels. Uh, throughout the links uh, between uh, cultural uh, diversity and biodiversity, through its influence, because uh, its contribution practices uh, result to the local traditional knowledge. Based on uh, age distribution, this is more to our population growth, aging and migration. For our safety uh, emphasis, how we are covering uh, protecting the safety, health and welfare of our, of our public. For education, we have give, given priority to knowledge, skills 
attitudes and value the public can uh, expose. Under public uh, acceptance, we have the public's opinion and understanding is very, very important for uh, sustainability uh, development. Under scale, we also have lack of uh, readiness for several social groups to embrace and adapt the technology changes that are needed in sustainability uh, city. Uh, this is because technology adoption and asset ownership need exposure. Urbanization can also lead to higher costs of living, which could impact low and middle income earners in selected social aspects. This is because housing conditions and quality of life, uh, basically migration, which has the pull and push theory, natural uh, increase. The Man, mean, uh, when we're managing uh, envi environment issues such as uh, water disposal, air and water pollution, traffic congestion, and the impact of urban to uh, rural urban, and also this becomes the growth for our community uh, commuter uh, settlements. The next, I'm going for technology. Usually, poor cybersecurity measures and controls can be uh, can make a smart city uh, susceptible to cybersecurity attacks. Mainly, we and we have. Um, malware denial of service attacks. This is basically uh, comprehensive smart cities uh, plans. They are designed to safeguard the security of the cyber security. Next, uh, smart city digital infrastructure uh, infrastructures uh, requires a large investment. Therefore, it's mainly very costly. Wireless technologies is connected and to improve uh, the infrastructure, infrastructure uh, efficiency, uh, convenience, and quality of life for our residents and visitors as it's a one of uh, investment before uh, maintenance. Long-term research and development of the new technology can be exhausting to be implemented. This is true because through R&D, new product can be designed and to improve it, we, uh, we expect it to contribute for a long-term uh, profitability. Lack of uh, expertise in building and developing a new technology this is basically the implementation side, which we need uh, someone uh, to be overall responsible. So we also need to import expertise. Next, I'm coming to the economics. Uh, usually, economics is basic uh, value of uh, what the company, I mean, the country is giving. Lack of uh, tech basically uh, workforce in the local manufacturing industries due to low skill uh, labor defense dependency hindering the industrial readiness for the digital age. Because uh, when we're coming to new technology, it takes um, the value of uh, the money for the, for the uh, country. Penang-based manufacturer, uh, manufacturers do not seem to be keen to move up the value chain to become uh, front-end uh, manufacturers due to huge investment costs and lack of expertise. Because since we are uh, state level, so we also need um, support from the federal level. Uh, average tourist also spending per visit and length of stay uh, in Penang due to impacting the investment of uh, household incomes. And this is, we, I mean, we took it from the Penang uh, Tourist Survey 2017. And the percentage of Penang loads, uh, low skilled workers in agriculture is four times higher than the national level. It also the path for modernization and diversification of the agriculture sector. This has been taken from uh, Penang 2030 and 2019's uh, slides. I'll pass over to Renuka. Okay, uh, thank you, Prita. So uh, next, I'll be moving on with the uh, remaining two factors of SIPA analysis. So before I move on further, I would like to introduce myself. So, uh, hi everyone, a very good evening. So, I'm Renuka Devi. Uh, earlier on, I was attached with the recruitment firm, Kelly Services. I was a uh, recruitment consultant over there. And uh, currently, I'm a full-time student, uh, postgraduate student uh, with USM Penang. So, and a housewife with uh, two children. So, as a civil society, I am more uh, interested in animal liberation. And I feel that we should be kind and respect the uh, animals as it is also a God-created living being. So uh, hence, my one of my social advocacy is about preserving the wildlife and also about uh, practicing vegetarianism. And I'm a vegetarian for my whole life and uh, actually I managed to encourage uh, many of my family members and also uh, my friends to be, uh, I mean, vegetarian. 
and then uh, I also uh, don't purchase any product uh, products made of uh, animal skin and uh, I've actually uh, strictly prohibit my families also to not use any products used from the uh, animal skin okay and then uh, apart from that um, I also uh, often feed um, I mean there, uh, there's a lot of cats or sometimes monkeys will be coming to my backyard so uh, I often feed them so uh, that's all for my introduction so right now let's move on to the uh, pull factors so um, so I'll be discussing on the environment political and aesthetic so first let, let's look at the environment so environmental regulations and protections so uh, since penang coasts and seas actually are mainly used for uh, fishing and aquaculture shipping uh, all right recreation and conservation and land development so right now for the environmental regulation and the protection uh, actually i like to choose um, i mean on the marine protection so uh, if you see that uh, there's a very um, i mean low capacity there's a very low uh, capacity of the uh, marine uh, i mean the authority to enforce the law on uh, sea pollution especially so if you could see that there's a limited capacity yes so the rele relevant department they do not have um, i mean enough manpower to carry out the frequent monitoring so even when the pollution is detected there's no guarantee that the source of uh, i mean who did the pollution actually so they can't identify who it is so uh, there's no proper marine or coastal uh, zoning um, uh, over there so it's insufficient so and then if you look at the drastic climate change so right now for the climate change right there's um, normally you can see that due to the climate change uh, there's uh, increased sea level and then uh, ocean acidification uh, and then also coral bleaching and so on so uh, what are the implications based on the climate uh, drastic climate changes is that like you can see like the lowlands like uh, areas like um, like uh, Nibong Tebal and also Bagansra and all that are affected by the sea level rise. So uh, if you could see, um, because they mainly affect the food security sources, because you can see like in Paribuntar and all that areas, they have these paddy fields and all that, so they are greatly affected. So and then um, Malaysia might actually uh, lose about a um, certain percentage of the paddy production so, uh, due to the sea uh, temperature increase and um, also due to the pH level increase okay we can see that uh, shellfish like cockles and penang seas will be greatly affected so um, so penang mainland is actually projected to be highly impacted by the sea level rise in the future so um, too many residential development projects which have reduced in the green area in penang if you could see that um, okay, penang is actually developing uh, urban areas are continuing to develop Okay, and uh, there are new towns and uh, even new uh, lands, um, uh, I mean, uh, expanding through the land reclamation. So, um, you know, to promote greener constructions and buildings, Penang local government is actually uh, providing incentives, okay, uh, to encourage the developers to actually aim for uh, green building uh, certification, especially the GBI, Green Building Index, so promoted by the, uh, the council. So, um, if you could see that, um, you know, uh, actually the GBI certification, right, the uptaking of the GBI, uh, GBI certification, actually, if you could see that it has been uh, very slow and the trend is likely to remain. So uh, positive and effective measures should be uh, introduced by the state government. If you could see right now, right, only uh, Batu Kawan is actually launched as the Eco City of, um, uh, I mean, as the Eco City Initiative to uh, create the sustainable growth um, for the new city. So um, actually, in reality, actually, what they need to do the enforcement and implementation of the. Uh, of this actually have actually it's lacking so uh, what they need to do they have to be i mean in order to achieve the eco city uh, um, i mean the eco penang sorry i mean uh, penang 2030 what apart from batu kawan they also should focus on other areas in penang like in um, in penang island so uh, they have to move towards the or convert or move towards the green township Next will be the attractiveness of sustainable city which can increase the number of people living in Penang which contributes to a rise in natural resources consumption. 
A rise in uh, natural resources consumption leads to deterioration of the environment through the uh, degradation of resources. So let, let's move on to the political factor. Inefficiency and inefficacy uh, in the use of funds due to the lack of streaming between activities and expenditures across state and local government and local government. So the current gov governance structure set out by the MKN20 pertaining to the disaster risk management is top down and uh, confined to uh, actually uh, government actors neglecting the role of public in recognizing and preparing for disaster risk. The slow digitization of government agencies causing an uh, impediment in keeping up with the uh, digital revolution. So next would be the aesthetics. So environmental uh, degradation uh, through depletion of resources such as water, soil, destruction and ecosystems then uh, habitat extinction. And then there's also urban environmental uh, policy challenges. And then uh, there's ineffective special planning cause uh, which causes balanced development, loss of valuable green spaces. Penang Island given more priority for urban development and mainland being the secondary choice. So there's a lack of public amenities and also uh, facilities in the city. And finally, lack of appreciation for cultural diversity and among um, the stakeholders leading to reduced preservation of uh, local cultural heritage. So uh, that's all for our full uh, factors of SIPA analysis. So I will pass next to uh, to my group member to present on the future wheels. Hi, thanks, Renuka. Hi. Um, this is Chuha. Currently, I'm working in Billion Stars as a operation manager. This is a transportation and logistic company. As part of civil society, I do practice to bring my own recycle bag for grocery shopping, do my own waste sorting at home before dispense them in the bin. Besides. I do participate in the program namely Guan Seli. It encourages everyone to let go the things that you no longer in use and give the unuseful thing a brand new life in other people's life. For example, your old clothes that you probably no longer wear, it could be donated to others that need them. So I'm currently pursuing my postgraduate program in USM Penang. That's the end of my introduction. Then now we'll go into the future views of Penang Sustainable City 2030. For future views, we, need, we have identified the issue to be focused on that will be technological advancement. From there, we can see there are at least six first-order impact. For instance, technological advancement will have a clear reflection on those outdated curriculum and syllabus in school and university which not using or imply any technology teaching yet and still teaching in own old traditional way. This might cause the second order impact where the student lack of fundamental knowledge on emergency, emerging technology trends. Thus, once the student graduates from school or university, they will most probably less prepare for the next industrial revolution. Meanwhile, for the technology advancement, we will see that the next first order impact would be the industry and firms would prioritize workforce with advanced technological skill. Those younger generation Workforce who well with who well equipped with the technological skill will have more demand compared to those older generation workforce who know nothing about the technology and refuse to learn them. This will cause the existing workforce to have skill mismatch from what they have and compared to what the market required. Further from it, it will increase the unemployment rate if the existing workforce still remain unchanged and unskilled. In addition, since cannot survive in Penang, the existing workforce might move out from Penang to look for other jobs opportunity in other cities. In order to fulfill the vacancy, the industry may import the tax savvy workforce from outside of Penang. The uncertainty or possible effect from this would be can the existing workforce be a rescue or they would consider obsolete in the new digital era. Next, I'll pass to Rin. Thank you, Chuha. So before I continue with the future sphere, let me introduce myself. So I am Reen. 
Okay, I am a full-time postgraduate student here in USM Penang. So in terms of my personal advocacy, uh, it would be to practice as well as to raise awareness and encourage practicing of sustainable lifestyle because uh, nowadays uh, there are so many environmental impacts from our lifestyle to the mother nature and one of it is waste. So I think that we must uh, start from the household level. So we must do as best as we can in terms of uh, source separation, as mentioned by uh, Juha, and other uh, environmental lifestyle changes that we could do in order to make sure that we are able to preserve and conserve our environment for our future generation. All right, so let me continue the future's wheel. Okay, so uh, the next consequence of technological advancement is that uh, barriers to technological adoption among Penang residents may arise, especially among uh, senior citizens, uh, those who are above the age of 60. This is because due to a greater burden to learn and to become familiar with technological trends and as well as tools, uh, senior citizens uh, may show some resistance in using the digital technologies and as a result of this, they may possess low digital literacy skill. So they may experience reduced ability to use online communication as well as social tools, uh, causing them to lose social connection with their long distance family and friends. Uh, adding on top of that point, technological advancements also cause the integration of IT in every part of our life. Uh, for example, we may order food simply through the scan of QR code. Uh, we uh, may be using um, e-wallets for payment. We also engage in scan and uh, shop during our grocery shopping. So all of these it may make uh, the senior citizen uh, feel socially excluded in some sort of way due to their reduced ability to participate in normal activities as well as relationships. Okay, and also the resistance to adoption among senior citizens uh, may also present challenges among them to live independently, especially in the technological era. And from this, uh, consequence from this point, we identify one question, all right, is, is that will technological advancements bring negative impacts on the long-term well-being of senior citizens? So now I pass to Renka for the next point. Okay, uh, thank you, Reen. So uh, right now I will continue with the um, next issue of the technological advancement. So, uh, there's actually a slow pace in technological change which leads to poor drainage and sewage system in Penang. So, uh, drainage problem is actually one of the, uh, I mean, huge issue in Penang which causes a lot of hassle to the uh, citizens. From there, I see that um, from, uh, I mean, the poor drainage and the sewage system, I see that uh, there's a consequences which when the drains and rivers clogged with trash from the uh, irresponsible human activities, actually it leads to flood during the, uh, when there's uh, intense raining. So where uh, it leads to landslides or erosions, where uh, it occurs as water runs into the ground and keeps the soil muddy. So uh, where it can actually bring a huge loss yeah i mean uh, damages to the food chain loss of property and then uh, even cause death and then there's a uh, damage to the water supply and uh, infrastructure even uh, the underground piping will be damaged so uh, and then if you could see the next consequences okay when the water runs into the ground during the rainstorm it actually pick up species uh, from the soil and it will contaminate the water sources so what happens is that it will actually spread a harmful diseases to the human, uh, such as like, for example, like um, typhoid, like cholera, hepatitis B and so on. So not only uh, it affects the human, but also uh, it destroys the wildlife and also the marine ecosystem. As Penang, you know, we know it's one of the main, I mean, uh, area coastline for this mar marine ecosystem. So again, what happens is that there will be definitely damages to the food chain because that's where from Penang we get all those seafood and all that, right? Okay, and then, um, you know, uh, next will be uh, next issue, uh, next consequences. 
uh, will be the partially treated uh, sewage or the decomposed waste into the river or sea may actually lead again to water contamination again uh, spreading the harmful diseases uh, destroying the wildlife marine ecosystem so uh, another thing is that it will actually create an uh, aesthetic nuisance due to the unsightliness and also the unpleasant smell which comes from the polluted drain or from the river so there's actually uh, one question derived from there um, is that uh, do you think that without adapting to the newer technology for example like uh, AMBBR it's actually an advanced um, what they call uh, it's um, it's a technology to actually treat uh, the sewage uh, uh, issue so an IoT or HPC is actually to control the flood system and the fl uh, risk, uh, risk of flooding so um, do you think that without this adapting to the uh, newer technologies the livelihoods of the uh, city misses in future so uh, that's all um, so i will pass next to uh, rin again to continue on the uh, next issue thank you renika okay all right so the next point is that technological advancement may also cause data security and privacy concerns among citizens. All right, so this is because smart city development consists mainly of collecting vast amount of data and including your personal data for analysis. Thus, uh, Penang citizen may fear of losing control over their own personal information if security safeguards are not really bulletproof. And the vulnerabilities that exist in the network, in the system, it can present opportunities for cybersecurity attacks, such as viruses, worms, uh, denial of service, as mentioned in our STIPA, and many more malicious attacks by responsible parties to uh, leading to a compromise to personal data. The last point is that uh, technological advancement also lead to advancement in the agriculture sector as Penang is moving into achieving agriculture 4.0. To ensure that the agriculture players are up to speed with this initiative, uh, there, are, there will be a rise in digital or smart agricultural training programs, which then will lead to improvements in agricultural processes as well as management and a rise in automation. So a question that will arise from this is that, will automation lead to a loss of jobs due to the elimination, elimination of many manual agricultural tasks? And then next is that uh, there will also be some cons where lack of technological knowledge will cause some farmers to show some form of resistance to adoption of new agricultural technology. So as a result, there will be an apparent knowledge and skill gap in smart farming and resistance to adoption also cause some of the Penangite farmers to lose their competitive edge or position both domestically and internationally because their competitors who adopt advanced technology will definitely have better yields in comparison to them, making them more attractive in comparison to those who don't adopt. So the last question that arises from this is that resistance to adoption of new agricultural technologies among some local Penang farmers will cause their competitive position to be threatened in the agricultural business. So those are our points from the future wheel. Moving on to the next part. Hello, hi everyone. My name is Shafika and I will be proceeding with uh, the last part of this presentation. So I am currently working as a demand management specialist in IHS market, Penang. And as part of a civil society, I always bring Tumblr, shopping bag, and metal straw with me everywhere I go because I am advocate to reduce the usage of plastic and reduce waste, which in the long run, my aspiration as a social entrepreneur is to lead a zero waste lifestyle by providing alternative ways on how to recycle, reuse, and reproduce things around us so we manage our waste better. Today, I will be presenting the emerging issues of the future on stakeholders' uh, engagement for Penang Sustainable City 2030. In order to make Penang Sustainable City 2030 is a reality, it is important to recognize the stakeholders in order to plan and execute a sufficiently rigorous stakeholders' engagement to address the risks and ethical issues as a core concern of stakeholders of this project. 
and they will affect directly or indirectly towards moving forward to Penang Sustainable City 2030. So the process involves stakeholders' identification, classification, communication, engagement, empowerment, and risk control. In the drive to become a sustainable city, challenges with which arise could be a problems associated with multiple diverse stakeholders, high levels of interdependence, competing values, and social complexity. So we have identified um, the stakeholders based on their level of influence and interest. So there are four quadrants, as you can see. Um, I will start from the left to the right. So uh, we have uh, interests. Uh, we have uh, on the left, we have built alignment, which uh, for stakeholders that have high interest and have high influence on Penang Sustainable City. So the first one is investors who are interested in aging society. Smart cities are very expensive to implement and also to operate. Therefore, a strong dependency on financial suppliers need to be uh, identified. By obtaining funding is key for the development of smart city and sustainable city and the investors mainly consider the return on the investment for the project. So it is good to build alignment with these investors. Second one is young social entrepreneurs. So social entrepreneurs are those who are very uh, advocate towards a sustainable city. Hence, we really need to build alignment with them in order to achieve this plan sustainable 2030. The third one is tech-based industry, IT experts, energy suppliers. So in smart city cities, Sustainability is an important concern. Therefore, sustainable energy supply is required for the operation of the smart city. Uh, there must also be sustainable energy policy for smart cities to play a key role in achieving the goals. Uh, we also need to engage with IT experts in the initiation and operational stage of smart cities. Technologies factors are identified essential requirement. Hence, um, these uh, a tech expert will uh, contribute for the development of smart cities. The first one is current manufacturers, factories, and company operating in Penang. So Penang have so many manufacturers, factories uh, in, in uh, operating here. So we need to build alignment with them to make sure that they are aware we are moving towards Penang Sustainable and Smart City 2030, and that they can uh, adhere to to our goals, to the Penang Smart City goals. Next one is Penang state, state government and policy makers. Um, so, smart cities offer solution for government in overcoming the challenges faced due to rapid urbanization. So, government is responsible for knowledge creation and capitalization, which is required for the initiation of smart city concept. Uh, while policy making and implementation is a key process leading to better transparency and accountability in smart city. In policy making, achieving sustainable ur urban development is key goal, and therefore, policymakers and government are more interested in making policies which leads Penang to be smart and sustainable, hence um, making the goals 2030 is a reality. So um, next one is uh, Penang Municipals. So Penang Municipal is one of the important stakeholders that we need to build an engagement uh, alignment in, in order to initiate, promote and supporting smart city projects because smart city projects require improved public service, public in infrastructures and uh, improve in rules and regulations, for example, like parking allocation space, public dustbin, and waste collection schedule around Penang. Administration can contribute for smart city projects in managing the resources and ensure that public adhere to the regulation imposed. Last stakeholders under the built engagement is property property developers. Um, okay, so smart cities um, are often driven. I mean, smart cities are often conflicting have conflict interest with property developers because property de developers always want to gain profit. Hence, we need to build alignment with property developers by ensuring that the development projects in Penang are following the Penang Sustainable and Smart City goal by injecting innovation and technological adv adv advancement in property development, um, building sustainable environment around the residential and industry areas. Okay, so moving on to the second quadrant is win over. So we need to win over this because they have high influence uh, and low interest. So the first, the first one is residents who are civil members of society, educated and also conservative. So for residents who are civil members of society, they are aware of sustainable city and smart city. So those we need to win over them so that they are, they are aligned with us in order to move towards building sustainable city 2030. The second one is senior citizens who are prop proper members of the society. So the uh, senior citizens here, here are referred to those who have retired 
and they are the populous members of the society. So they have influence, high influence in in uh, engaging with their society to align with us or to to follow us uh, in achieving Penang Sustainable City 2030. Next one is uh, we need to win over the media because uh, media are the one who will tell to the public about this Penang uh, Sustainable City 2030. The public needs to know. So that, that's, that's why we need media and also we need social media influencers to promote the sustainable lifestyle in Penang because because it's just not a goal, it's, it's just not a dream. It's something that a lifestyle and we need to adhere to a lifestyle uh, as a smart uh, as a smart and sustainable city. Next, we uh, I, uh, I will move to the next quadrant, which is engage. So we need to engage for those who have high interest uh, and low influence. Who are they? So they are graduate, young and millennials entering workforce. workforce. So as the young graduate, youth and millennials, they are more outspoken. They are very enthusiastic and uh, in uh, living a sustainable lifestyle. Hence, um, though they have low influence, but they have very high interest. So we need to engage with them so that they can, um, you know, they can uh, influence their colleagues at the new work. They can uh, influence their friends to, to lead a sustainable lifestyle. Next, uh, we need to engage higher education in institutions and colleges in Penang because they are the one who will who will uh, provide the graduates to the workforce and the future of the Penang. So, the future of the Penang's the, the future generation should be aware about Penang Sustainable City, and they should start working towards it. Next, uh, uh, is scientists, academic and research institution. So scientists uh, and the ex and the experts, uh, they are the the one who knows what to do or or what's the right way uh, to uh, to go to sustainable and smart city concept. Hence, we are required them to be involved in the planning process of initiating smart city. They are important in innovation processes as well or improvement um, uh, of the process. Next is proponents of digital farming. So Penang is the first state. Um, to launch the country's uh, first vanilla smart farm by using agriculture technology 4.0, comprising of Internet of Things technology, artificial intelligence, big data application, as well as machine learning and drone system. Through the dis digital planting method, vanilla yield was estimated to worth 1.5 million per year, and it will be exported to Japan. Besides, there are planning to collaborate with industry players to further develop the digital planning mechanism by using robotic technology. Hence, we need to engage with this digital farming because it's, it's something that uh, sustainability would require, digital farming. Lastly, we need to engage with non-profit organizations. So non-profit organizations are those who are very advocate. They have their own uh, purpose and, and they, they would like to achieve sustainable city. So we need to engage with them because they have high interest in, in achieving these goals and they will help us to achieve this goal. Lastly, would be mobilized. So mobilized are those who have low influence and low interest in the Spinning Sustainable City 2030. So those are elderly folks with disability or dependents, illiterate groups, traditional farmers, and citizens of Penang besides the civil members of society and social advocates. So we need to mobilize them from having low interest and low influence. We need to mobilize them so that they will have at least some interest and and uh, some influence towards achieving this. Uh, because you know, in, in order for us to achieve business sustainability, we also need to address these people who feel like they don't they don't know what's going on. So we need to nurture some interest in them so that we can achieve this business sustainability. 2030. So that's all from me. Um, as a conclusion, Smart City um, is a multi-stakeholders ecosystem where, where stakeholders engagement is important for the success. With the rapid urbanization, cities are facing many challenges in achieving sustainability. So these challenges lead the requirement of sustainable urban development within Penang. So in, in Smart City development, stakeholders engagement is considered an important factor for the success of the project. We cannot achieve Penang Sustainability 2030 without the engagement of these stakeholders. Thank you.
So hi everyone. First of all, I will introduce myself. I'm Janani Mutu. Previously, I have worked in healthcare industry as a radiotherapist in radiotherapy department. Radiotherapy department where the cancer patient were treated with high radiation to kill their cancer cells. There's a main work for us. So currently, I'm a housewife with two children and a full-time student. So my personal advocacy is to give the best and good services to the one I needed. During my working period in the healthcare industries, I had experience uh, involved in many CSRs program organized by the hospital, such as family run, blood donation campaign, cancer survival campaign. Before I start my slide, today me and my group members will be presenting on the Penang Sustainable City 2030 uh, in social advocacy for change. I will move on to my first slide with STIPA analysis. This is my STIPA analysis. So I'll move on to my first factor that will be societal. So I'll be combining push and pull factor together. So the first point, the life quality of the people were enhanced uh, for the inclusion of uh, all the life, including the young, old and the needy people. The life quality is enhanced for the three main points, which will be provision of land for recreation activities, uh, for active aging programs and affordable housing for the low income groups. So the pull factor will be the more space in the Penang were taken up because the Penang state is very small and it hindrances the mission of the economical. So adding up to the lo local government, the financial was burdened due to the emits of the COVID-19 economic woe. For the third point will be the Penang 2030 overall counterintuitive to the master blueprint plan of smart city. It's uh, mainly for the living space which uh, for the equal and cheap to build the cost and ends logically and smart and green homes that build up by the local governance. Uh, move on to the second factor that will be technology, propelling industry 4.0, uh, which mainly they focus on to prepare and to read on the local manufacturing industry when faced to for a digital era and green movement. For the pool factor, Full segment implementing costly green initiative in the industry, lengthy transition of SME to industry 4.0, which uh, mainly burdened the pandemic. Uh, by implementing new technology, make their life easier, such as using free wireless around area, Penang area. This uh, mainly improved the technology in Penang area compared to other states so the third factor will be education so i'll be on start on push so since 2016 a non-profit organization arts ed which mainly they focus on arts and culture program the state agency which uh, may protects on and promotes the georgetown agriculture and culture inheritance to work together to for the organization of culture heritage education program. For the pool, uh, there are still uh, a lack of education program organized by the state agency. To recover this problem, they have boost up the children's education and improve more to uh, help the needed to encourage them to improve their education level. For the fourth factor will be environment. Penang will fulfill the United Nations 2017 Sustainable Development Goals by year to 2030. So for the poor, 
Penang will be spending more to build their environment to a balance through effective spatial planning. For the fifth factor will be the political. So every individuals who are empowered individually has a personal freedom to implement a demographic policies. For the poor, the players were not the politic parties but politicians but general people of the Penang. For the final factor, will be aesthetic. So for the push, um, by year 2030, the Penang will be provide a larger uh, variety of affordable home to improve their public safety and to provide uh, welfare aid for the need, needed persons. For the poor, the stakeholders were involved in different level of developments to push the economic insta- infrastructural, cultural and society development of Penang. Okay, I will pass to Azura. Hi, good day, Dr. and Oz. I would like to continue on future wheels. Before that, let me introduce myself. I'm Zura Ashila. Currently, I'm working as production supervisor in Kulin High Tech, and I have been here around five years. For information, my company is based on medical manufacturing, and we are producing medical devices, something like tube for anesthesia vision. As personal social advocacy, in future, I would like to support all the development or any program to sustainability. Speaking about impact of COVID to our manufacturing, of course, it's a, it is a huge impact because our product is a TQ product and hospital can choose another product from other competitors for their usage. Then the impact is management start to reduce here and there to sustain. But luckily, until now, management still maintain with current headcount is a uh, give impact to the other stakeholder. This is what I will explain on the future wheel. Okay, firstly, our group has identified the emerging issue regarding PNN 2030 is digital literacy, which is related with technology advancement. Why we choose the digital literacy is because we found that it can champion in the effort of equality for the work of life and we align with people empowerment. What you can see here is a this is a future wheel of PNN 2030. We designed this wheel based on steeper that can I explain. So as what you can see here, there is many circles with the different color, which this color representing the impact of the steeper. Okay, the, you see the gray color is the steeper, blue the first impact, so, uh, purple is the second impact, and the yellow one representing the, the third impact, which is with the uncertainty situation happen. To more understand about the wheels, let me go through two or three circles. As PN2030, the team are to increase liability, to enhance quality of life, upgrade the economy, empower people to strengthen participation and will increase, invest in the built environment to improve resilience. Okay, firstly, let me see the social. With the social, government help to provide affordable housing, which is the people in the middle range the effort to buy a house with fully facility. With this PNM, we'll be going to be the best place to stay or to retire and can make easy for their people with the commodities. Okay, second step part is technology. With the technology, pinning stakeholder will receive a lot of benefit. Looking at the wheels, the impact is going to global innovation, drive the people more creative and will lead to positive impact which is more competitive and going to be a world leader. Just imagine with these people with IT knowledge, we help the healthy growth of cities. But in the middle towards for positive growth, there is much an issue that if we are overlook on that can be disruptive the objective of PN 2030. Can you see the dot dot red cycle? This is one of the disruptive issue will lead to unhealthy lifestyle or I can see lead to the broken family. Okay, if people misuse the technology or IT or too dependent on technology, I give example. 
on kids nowadays. Parents are using their handphone or gadgets to help their children keep calm and quiet. Uh, you did the same thing as yourself. If parents to depend on devices for their, ch for their children or kids, then most of the time kids will spend their time with gadget because for them no need love from parents but just need gadget. Nowadays parents busy with work and kids busy with gadget. Then when the time they are playing outside. They only stay inside the house with the game here and there. You can see in the yellow circle they are not doing outside activity, no sweating, no breath, the fresh air and other friend as and no other friend except their online friend. This is lead to unhealthy lifestyle will be leaked to broken family also because in marriage communication is one of the most important if you are just bit gadget when you spend the time with your spouse or your family this also if not be taken action will be impact on the harmonious family relationship for conclusion becoming smart does not only include investing in the new upcoming technology but how to bring in the technology into implementing adoption understanding amongst citizen i think i will stop here and pass the next slide to Yvonne. thank you Hi everyone, my name is Yvonne and professionally I am an educator. Before I move on to explain about this, let me have a short introduction about myself. So yeah, like I said, I am an educator and because of my work nature, I am always sensitive or have heightened awareness for students' welfare, if you can put it like that. It just means that I pay more attention uh, whenever there are news that involve students and that inevitably shape my personal social advocacy, which is the equal IT opportunities uh, for rural communities for the students, right? So I'm not sure if anyone is aware about this um, very recent incident that happened in in the state of Sabah, there's this student, Viviona, right? Uh, she's a university student and because of the recent, uh, as you all know, the, the implication of COVID-19 is that a lot of uh, educational uh, institutions has started this online learning thingy and um, students are required to have um, to submit assignments to do a lot of tests and so forth so for her she has to climb up a tree in order to get internet connection and uh, it's really ridiculous uh, for me because, you know, as a Malaysian, I, I would I would say that we are not that far behind in the technological advancement part, but there are still some of us, unfortunately, who can't even get a stable internet connection. And that's a shame. And most recent news following up on that would be the collapse of a suspension bridge in Ranau. It's a district in Sabah again. Uh, it collapsed after eight students crowded on it to get internet uh, access because on that particular suspension uh, bridge, it was one of the very few places that could get internet connection in that kampong area, right? In that rural area in Ranau district. So that's why my personal social advocacy is definitely this equal internet uh, and information uh, take, uh, opportunities. It's equal for all these uh, rural students in the rural communities. I think that's all that sums up pretty much about me and what I care about uh, for the well-being of the, of the students uh, for that matter. And let us continue with the presentation today. Based on the slide, I will be talking about these trends right? The future trends of sustainable cities. And that's uh, what, uh, that is what you are looking at right now. Now, whenever we talk about sustainability, we are actually referring to these three P's that you see at the left-hand side. We have people for the first P and then we have planet and we have profit, right? 
So before I go into further into this, all this information here, let me just explain to you, okay, what people means, what planet means, and what profit means here in relation to sustainability. So for people, we actually measures uh, the social performance, including the quality of life. Like for a sustainable uh, city or even a nation, we need to measure, okay, for the people aspect. That is whether or not they have a good quality of life. And for the planet, we are capturing the environmental factors like energy emissions and pollutions and relevant issues, okay, similar to that. And lastly, for profit, I think we all can agree that the word sustainable means uh, uh, everlasting, you know, it's going to be going on for a longer period of time. And for any entities, be it uh, corporations, enterprise, or even a nation or cities, you need to have this profit uh, aspect of it. We need to access the business environment and the economic uh, performance, okay, uh, of this um, when we talk about sustainable. Uh, now, may I have your attention to be diverted to the right-hand side where you can see the chart here. This chart is actually a sustainable cities rating uh, back in 2015. And you can see that, that Frankfurt, a city in Germany, tops the chart, right? That means if you can see the, the blue color that represent people, Okay, and then uh, we have planet that is uh, representing by the color of uh, orange and then we have green for profit, right? So you can see that Frankfurt is top and for that matter, for people, Frankfurt rated nine, for planet and profit, Frankfurt rated number one for the for the other two aspects so it's very incredible i see someone asked about what about malaysia yeah if you can see that kuala lumpur yes by it's ranked at 26 in this chart in this rating it's not too bad okay it's not too bad and for that matter for people uh kuala lumpur rated or uh, state in the chart for the rating of 23 and then for planets 24 and then for profit it's 22 okay it's not all too bad now what this means actually if you look i'm just gonna explain for frankfurt okay it's too long of a list for me to talk about so for frankfurt what actually makes this city so special or so sustainable that it tops the chart? Well, let's look at the planet or even the profit part because for those two aspects, uh, the city ranked top. So we, we have three things here, okay? For number one, okay, number one, they have this new master plan that is uh, named 100% cr climate protection. Okay, by 2050. This is Dear City's Master Plan, 100% climate protection. And how does that work? It means that by 2050, they will have 100% of their energy that will be uh, sourced from renewable sources, okay? Renewable sources. And because of that, because of that, that caused 95% decrease in greenhouse gas emission. That's number one. And also, you might want to know that Frankfurt actually rated uh, the European City of Trees 2014. That means every tree in the city is registered and monitored and the public can access information about each and every single of the tree in that particular city online. So this uh, uh, has accountability, yeah? And um, people can see, can know that the, the city that they are living in is truly sustainable for that matter. And the one last point for me per se that ranked them, that, that uh, contributes to their high ranking uh, in fact, the, the top ranking is that 15% of all commutes already done by bicycle within the city. So that is pretty impressive. So let's, uh, because of that, that is the current, okay? Or oh, because this chart is uh, dated 2015 and I still can say it's a current uh, trend. Let's look at the future trends. 
get the future trends. If you have your attention uh, for the center of the slide, you can see there are five ticks here, right? So for, for us, these are the future for a sustainable entity, be it cities, enterprise, nations, whatever. So these five, number one, zero emissions transportation. Okay, that is because of, I, I imagine you have heard about Tesla, you have heard about all these hybrid cars, but in the future, we are truly aiming for zero emission, right? Uh, that could be because of advancement technology, not so sure how that's going to be happening, but that is happening for sure. Second one, increase biodiversity. Increased biodiversity simply means that in a city where people are living, there are a lot of like, uh, it's packed with people, but we need it to be packed with other living organisms beside humans, right? Beside humans. So uh, I would have you know that there are a lot of cities currently in Hong Kong, in China, that they have already implemented this uh, condo living where they are uh, introducing green rooftop there's a project and their governments are actually funding them giving them subsidies to the contractor to the uh, construction companies developer to develop such housing that can enable the fusion or the inclusion of flora and fauna in the living uh, space right so that's the take number two for the third one energy conscious construction so this is following number two right so energy conscious construction a further improvement in the uh, construction materials okay how to we are talking about global warming every day you know everyone is concerned about global warming and we are guilty of using a lot of ac now in, in our offices in our houses in our homes so maybe they need to come up with something that can reduce the, the heat that's gonna be collected or in in the in the living area so that that's it you know in, in terms of the advancement in the material in the construction to build buildings houses shop lots that can massively reduce the uh, electric consumptions okay uh, by not using that much of uh, acs right so waste management uh this is a definite um millennial topic i would say because people nowadays are talking about no straws uh, no plastic bags uh recycle we use and all of those things uh, those things and waste management is much more than that it's about sorting as well it's about repurposing uh materials or, or possessions that are no longer useful to us but might be very useful to others so yeah waste management is the whole uh topic a whole area that we are going to focus or that is going to be the trend for the future intensively so last but not least that would be smart cities uh for for us per se uh, a sustainable city is a city that is smart like right? true technology every transactions uh will be done electro electronically if possible to reduce paper waste for example uh to maximize efficacy to reduce the need of uh, unnecessary manpower and all of those things so yeah these five would be for us the future trends for sustainable cities now now that we have a uh, uh, sort of discussed about that let's have our attention to the bottom here where you can see role of se uh means social enterprise yeah so we do have roles right to play and you can see these five key words here these five key words number one to promote yeah so to promote the participation of stakeholders and the community in the process of creating social enterprise that's for promoting the second one to connect connect to sustainable local and regional development for highly motivating social purposes 
uh, we are all human beings. We have uh, real feelings, true feelings, and we are more connected when we can see things with our own eyes, when we can feel things, when we can participate. So yeah, this connect it means exactly that. Number three, we have built. We need to build. The, the role of SE, SE is to build consensus on a definition of social enterprise and purposes in the internal process of creating such entity. Now, achieve. We achieve sustainable regional and local development by reinvesting profit. So all this profit, all these fundings from corporates, from uh, private, uh, from private stakeholders, they are reinvesting those values, those resources, okay, to achieve a sustainable um, development per se. The last one would be collaborate. Yeah, so SE, they need to collaborate with various sectors, various industries. We can't do it alone. And then with that, there will be a synergy created and everything will uh, go accordingly. So yeah, that should be all for this slide. So the next part, as uh, explained by Zura just now, our social advocacy is digital literacy, right? So, and I have explained the trends, the future trends, and now we are looking at the implications of those trends for our social advocacy. And you can see here, there are quite a few. Let me start by uh, talking about the first one, redirected education focus. Yeah, redirected education focus. It's for the betterment, uh, I would say it's for, for the good. It's on the plus side. We redirect how we form our syllabus, what is important, what is to be taught, what is to, to be included in the education of our uh, Malaysian children, Malaysian students. So that's that. Emphasis on efficiency. This is what the essence of sustainable means for us. You know, you, you have to be efficient uh, in order to reduce or uh, just altogether avoid unnecessary waste in terms of resources, in terms of times and so forth. The third one would be birth of more green practices or business, okay? And that would mean like a lot of um, uh, enterprises that are focused on mm, like in the nature of social enterprise, uh, like Pika Eats, uh, for example, uh, that's a, a social enterprise that trying to solve a problem of the um, statelessness, the, the state or the nature of this uh, cast away or outcast of society. For example, all these people that from other country that has no place to go, but uh, stuck, unfortunately stuck in our country. And, and they have created all these kind of uh, to, to collaborate with them and make them into a participating or contributing uh, part of our society. So there are a lot of other green practices as well, like uh, not providing straws for a lot of these participating fast food chains like McDonald's. So yeah, we will see uh, more of that. And that is the implication of those trends and also on the good side. A positive swift of governmental policy towards digital literacy. So the government uh, has no other options but to uh, acknowledge and to recognize and to proactively make changes in their policy to facilitate digital literacy uh, in our societies. And that's all for the good ones, the good uh, benefits or the good effects of these trends. We have three major uh, downsides for this. That would be the greater digital divide amongst us. Okay, uh, this actually means like if you just pay more attention, you, you, you notice that West and for the digital divide amongst us, it's basically mean that if you just look at the West and East Malaysia situations, not everyone has equal or even uh, internet connection for, for that matter. And as our effort or movement to towards this uh, uh, technological advancement, there are some of us that are really, really lacking behind and that's not really fair. 
And because of that, there will be desperate measures for digital inclusion. Like maybe the government is giving、uh, free laptops, for example, that I recall was done a、uh, few years back for school kids. But、um, those are really desperate measures for、uh, for for us because not all the、uh, laptops or the fundings are put to、uh, good good use、uh, for、uh, per se. So the last one would be further impediment towards sustainability due to the lack of digital infrastructure. If you say you want to move forward in certain area, first off, you must have the tool. We don't even have the tool、uh, in so many states that are outskirts of towns, and that could、uh, make us、uh, really lagging behind in the in the race or in in order to chase up or to. Just get our our pace or our stage to be at par with other cities,、uh, for example. Yeah.、Uh, so, all right. This slide, I think, it's pretty clear. Let's move on to the next one. Hi. So let's continue for the theory of change on social advocacy in digital literacy. Uh, for sustainable city, sustainable city, Penang, twenty thirty. Okay. Let's look at the problem. We have low computer literacy among government school students. That's the problem, and the assumption is that we need to have minimum knowledge.、Um, that's the case. We just have minimum knowledge. So the absence of intrinsic value and understanding towards the issue. So the issue being that the need for digital literacy. So in that case,、uh, students are oblivious, or even the parents, or in a bigger sense, the society is oblivious of the disadvantages that they are having due to this minimum knowledge for computer literacy. So for audience and entry point, we need to engage the policymakers, being the、um, KPM and educators. We need to be presenting actual data showing the just the position of most students. Okay, and how they are not destined to fail, but they are designed to fail. The design to fail meaning to say that、uh, authorities is actually、uh, designing something that is、uh, failing these、uh, rural kids. Okay, the kids that the students that have not、uh, internet connection or、uh, like. Even any digital infrastructure to facilitate the the digital literacy or the bigger plans, okay, moving forward to the sustainable city planning 2030. So the assumption is that after we make the our entry point, after we engage the policymakers, we would have national attention. We will ride the wave of COVID-19 and propel the force towards this. Meaning to say that I assume and I strongly think that parents in Malaysia nowadays is like、uh, sort of aware or have their senses heightened around the issue of or the needs to have a computer, the needs to be、uh, connected online,、uh, especially for the kids. Because of this COVID nineteen, because all the schools are、uh, commencing online learning, so that's our assumptions. So we have steps to do in order to bring change. The first one, we need to form synergy with、uh, across sectors, across industries, right? And we need to propose and structure the project properly. And then we're gonna get media exposure and finally gather parent support. So because whenever we talk about students, parents are the actual stakeholders that we need to involve and engage. So the assumption would be we would definitely face a multitude of objections and even rejections, but also gaining resonance from the public.、Uh, yeah. So that's it. For the measurable effects, okay. If this is moving accordingly, students will have increased knowledge on computer literacy, and with that,、uh, the school works could be completed with computer, and we can have comprehensive results on report card for everyone to see. So the assumption is that. With the availability of the facilities, we break down the wall of disconnectivity and ignorance. And last but not least, we're going to talk about the wider benefits and long-term change. 
So we think that people would be more aware and sensitive towards information and higher acceptance for change and advancement. So these actually prepare the younger generations and everyone for greater readiness for any hardships, much like COVID-19. So the assumptions would be we're going to have a competitive youth force, right? And they are going to drive our nation uh, to develop towards greater height and uh, in internationally or even locally and such. So actually, the last slide will be just talking about if then what? If then, I mean, if if we are able really to propel the the movement of Penang 2030, if then the budding youth of Malaysia will stand on equal ground with each other, and that is exactly what we want, right? And having restored their birthright as humans to access information, and for us educators, we all know that accessing information is the first step of learning so we can maximize their full potential with technology through this reform society that is based on unprecedented equity and social justice so yeah that pretty much sums up our concerns or our presentation uh for today thank you right thank you yvonne thank you uh, both teams so I believe it is time for us to say uh, our goodbye. It is great to have our session and we hope this will be of uh, great sharing to, with the larger community later on. We will see each other again at another platform. All right. So thank you very much, everyone. Bye. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, guys. Bye.